Squeezing in one more team top prospect list here before the end of the week. It's the call up, and we're talking raised top prospects here. I'm Aram Layton. He's Jack McMullen. And we were hoping to get this one in just before the end of the week. Of course, the Matt Canarino interview was a ton of fun. Uh, if you haven't heard that yet, check that out. Twins prospect who's finally healthy, three plus pitches, a monster. I'm excited to do the twin system now because we're going to talk about where he fits in. But such an awesome dude. If you missed that episode, go check that out. But the Rays perpetually have a great farm system, and the Rays are always a farm system that's going to take us a little bit more time to, uh, I think, summarize, do the write-ups on, and rank because you want to make sure you don't miss anybody. And especially when you look outside of the top 10, there's a lot of different players that could have a case to sneak into that 10 to 15 range, and that was kind of hard to sort out. So we're going to talk about that. Of course, as always with the Rays, there's a lot of really good names to watch. But then it gets really fun at the top of it. They, they seem to always have a handful of top 100 prospects that you can get really pumped about and plenty of future big league role players, even if they're not in the top 10. But Jack, this is probably a little bit different of a, of a race system than maybe we've seen in the past. I would say in, in the regard that there's not quite as much pitching as we're used to. We did graduate Shane Boz just because yeah. I, I just have no interest in ranking that guy anymore. He's really freaking good. He's a he would be the top pitching prospect in the system. He'd be a top 100 prospect. Like I, I haven't seen him throw in two years. So like I, there's no point in ranking him. And he also has 40 big league innings under his belt, yeah. too. Like I, I don't really understand what goes into still ranking Shane Boz because I think it's it's two separate big league stints and it's 40 innings at the major league level. So it doesn't compute in my brain. I, I'm with you. This is clearly if the Pirates and the Rays combined their top prospects, we'd have like oh. the most well-rounded system ever seen. But like yeah. the Pirates are all pitching. The Rays seemingly are all hitting. And dude, I was even going through the names to watch. It's like it's really hard for me to find pitchers right now. We know they spawn relievers. The Eflin deal was the perfect example of them IDing a guy that's already 30, that already has five, six years of big league success under his belt, and they're just going to turn him into a monster. So I'm not worried about them on the pitching front whatsoever. The other thing that I feel like this system is lacking that they have had in recent years is another top of the line blue chip guy. And you could argue that Meade and Xavier Isaac and Carson Williams are there, but mm -hmm. I'm so used to Tampa always having like two borderline top 10 prospects in baseball. And they have one in Kevin Arrow, but a Williams and Isaac, a Mead, they all kind of seem like 30 to me, not yeah. 10. Yeah, one of those guys needs to kind of separate from the group, and we'll get to them and talk about who has the biggest chance to do so. But yeah, it's it's that one like tier one A guy, and then you're waiting for one of those three guys to separate themselves. Where you like where Curtis Mead is, you like where where Carson Williams is overall, and 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 even Xavier Isaac, the year that he had was fantastic. Very different profiles across the board, but all guys that kind of settle into that you know thirty ish range to fifty ish range in the top prospect list when our top one hundred comes out, but a couple of those guys may be a little bit higher than some others in the industry. Uh, the last thing I'll say is, you know, I think that this is a very concerted approach by the Rays as well. Like they, they've taken short stops, I'm pretty sure, with their comp pick the last like four years. Um, they they know that they're going to be able to go trade for for pitchers, identify them, like going to get a Ryan Pepe out in in that deal for Glass. Now being able to go sign free agents the way that they have when they do decide to spend. Um, and then being able to just identify, I think, in those trades is the easier way for them to do it. They'd rather draft the bats that they really like, and it's worked out pretty well for them through the years. So I will say this is a system that if they can push these guys across the finish line, I think we talk about the, the trio that we're waiting on, and then some of these younger players that have big upside, you can see the system really strengthen. The question is, they have kind of struggled to translate some of these top, top prospects into production at the big league level. And that's kind of the last thing they, they seem to have guys that can climb the minors decently well, but seem to just be blitzed by big league competition. And, and I think it's interesting the Rays. I know that's just everybody that's baseball. Yeah. The MLB is the hardest level, but with the Rays, I've, I've heard it from the fans. There's a level of frustration of like, why isn't it translating to the big league level? So we'll talk about some of the guys that we think can make that transition and can, you know, hit the ground running in the big leagues uh, when we get to those players in the top 10. It, the, la the last thing it's, it's crazy to me because we look at the Rays as like 
maybe the best developer in baseball. And we look at the year by year standings at each level in the minor leagues. And the Rays affiliate is always competing for a championship at that mm-hmm. level. Always. Was it 2021 where I think they swept or like Montgomery lost the championship series, but Charleston won, Bowling Green won, um, Durham won, and then the Rays yep. won the American League East. It, just ridiculous what they can do. But you take a peek at what they have going at the big league level in their lineup. Yandy Diaz was a, an Indians prospect, a Guardians prospect. Randy Arozarena was a Cardinals castoff. Isak yeah. Paredes was the once top prospect for the Cubs and the Tigers. Look, he's in Tampa now. Jonathan Arana, he was there forever. Jose Siri was supposed to be this big thing in Cincinnati, and then he flames out in Houston, and all of a sudden he recaptures this magic here. It, it's fascinating to me, aside from, you know, of course, like a Wander Franco, who was the top prospect for them and turned into a great player for them. They find guys that are misfits everywhere else and they plug in at the big leagues. They are really good at developing talent in the minor leagues, trading that talent for controllable pieces, and then those controllable pieces blossom. And before they hit the open market, they trade them again. It's a rhythm. I love the rhythm. A lot of people hate the rhythm, but it's a cool rhythm. And they're good at identifying those players that, you know, aren't the tradable assets and are the guys that they hold on to and and, and build around. And, and for the most part, they've done a good job with that. The Josh Lowe's of the world, Brandon Lousman, injury plagues, but, you know, we've seen him hit 40 at the highest level. Like that's another guy that translated. So, you know, it works in, in those areas. Let's get into the names to watch here. Of course, you can follow along with the link in the episode description. And if you're watching on YouTube, it's right there up on the screen. Jack, as always, lets you take it away here, and I'll just chime in a little bit. Yeah, so I'm actually going to need you to kind of run point on Willie Vasquez because there is <laughs> not much that I'm going to bring to the table on Willie Vasquez because you know he's a guy that finished the year in high A Bowling Green. He played the entire year in high A Bowling Green. I think it's pretty interesting that it's kind of a foregone conclusion that he's moving to the outfield when he really hasn't played the outfield since a ta- like a taste at the complex. Um, he can bounce around the infield, third, short, second, whatever. He's a big guy. He's 6'3". He's got room to fill out. But, man, like the numbers are meh. Had a 310 yeah. OBP, OPS 700. Like, Is there anything data-wise that mm-hmm. get, gets you going on Willie Vasquez? Yes. I, I own one Willie Vasquez Bowman Chrome Auto that I bought for $20 just because of how hard he hits the baseball. But the swing is so inefficient. It was so many ground balls. He really struggles to elevate and and, and turn that raw power into anything. Um, And he's, you know, very aggressive. But a 90th percentile exit velocity of like 106 point something miles per hour. Like he hits the ball hard. He's put up EVs at 113. And there's still more room in the frame. So I'm like, this guy hits the ball so hard. I'm not going to, I'm not going to ignore him until he's, 24 25 and doing the same thing so it's got another year or two to, to try to translate that into production but it, it's just the swing path is just not help doing him any favors and neither is the approach yeah uh next one is juan pierre i mean chandler simpson uh triple <laughs> a outfielder he stole 94 bags he's victor scott's best friend of the cardinals they shared the stolen base crown this past year 94 bags although i think victor won it because he was caught 14 times Simpson was caught 15 times, so a smidge higher percentage. Um, if you were to attach a run grade to him, it's like the easiest 80 you ever hand out. Yeah. One of them. Yeah. If you attach a power grade to him, like he and Xavier Edwards are at the, the bottom. He's hit one homer. Point. Yeah, he's hit one homer since his high school graduation. It came in his draft year at Georgia Tech. One. He will never hit a homer maybe in the at the major league level. <laughs> Uh, unless the stars align, but dude, he can be a game wrecker as a center fielder on the base pads. If he's getting on base and dude, he got on base a ton and he punched out less than 9% of the time last year. He walks a lot and he's putting bad on ball. I think better than a lot of people would have expected. It's a really interesting throwback profile, but a, a player that I think is fun to have in your system. And you know, the Rays can find a way to utilize this guy, but I think just at the very least, you feel good that he can be that, you know, Gerard Dyson speed up type of player, but I think he's more talented offensively uh, and has a little bit more going for him. So I'm interested to see how it all plays out. He's not one Pierre, but he's really close. Um, <laughs> Austin Shenton had one of the better years in the upper minors that frankly wasn't talked about. He mm-hmm. hit over 300, 29 homers, 99 driven in, in OPS over a thousand 
guy got on base at a 423 clip. So he hit 304, but he had an 120 point jump from batting average to OBP. He was third base primary when he was in Montgomery for the first three months of the season. Back three months of the season, he was splitting his time evenly between third and first. I said in here, he's just totally falling into the Aranda bucket. He's yeah. too talented for minor league baseball. There's just no space up there. Because yeah. who's he going to displace? Yandi? Isak Paredes? Yeah. No. Heck, Aranda is even, you know, he's, he's probably behind Aranda in line. So it's it's a weird situation. I, I, he was probably 15B on here, um, mm-hmm. you know, like very, very close to, to being in the top 15. Um, the, the EVs you know, are, are good, not great. And for how much whiff there is in the zone, it's not egregious, but there's it, there's a good amount of whiff in the zone. Uh, yeah, I'd like to see a little bit more raw power because naturally, you know, in the big leagues are – you're not going to be able to to hit as many home runs. There's not going to be as many mistakes to square up down the middle, you know, and and you're not going to get your your A plus plus swing off all the time. Uh, and so I, I don't know if there's room for error uh, in the power department. Like I don't think it affords him enough with how much he whiffs, if that makes sense. He does hedge with the with the low chase rate and the ability to walk, uh, but I do think he could be a platoon option, crush righties, and we know that the Rays maximize those types, right? Like the platoon guys yeah. that you know are kind of viewed as positionless and, and, and whatever it may be putting those guys in positions to succeed. He's not a great defender really anywhere, but he can play first. He can play a passable third can play a passable second. That helps. I do think that there's a big league platoon piece here um, for in Austin Shenton. I think he's, you know, was a borderline top 15 guy. Yeah. Moving on. Don't read the blurb. If you haven't yet, don't look it up. Trey Morgan, 56 professional plate appearances. How many times did he punch? Um, 56, how many times did he punch? Plate appearances, you said? Yeah, 56 plate appearances. Uh, th- three? Three, exactly three. Actually. He struck out three times in 56 plate appearances in his first 14 Crazy. professional games. He ran a 10% K rate at LSU this past year in the SEC, and he was the unheralded star of that team. Everybody wanted to focus on Tommy White and Paul Skeens and Dylan Cruz and even a Thatcher Hurd and a Ty Floyd. Like there were so many guys above Trey Morgan on that stardom depth chart for mm-hmm. LSU, but he is an elite defensive first baseman. He does not strike out. Does he lack power for first base? Yes, he does. But I, I saw the Evan White comp and it like it makes sense. Everybody just wants to tab like, hey, minimal power, but great glove at first base. Everybody wants to do that. It's not Prado because Prado has more juice and more swing and miss. There is value here in some form or fashion from being an elite defensive first baseman and hitting the ball enough, spraying it around. He could be that kind of guy that hits 280 with a slug right around 400. Yeah, and that's the thing. I think that's the magic number there, right? Can he slug four? And you can do that with doubles and enough homers. What's interesting too is is they did play him and left a fair amount, um, you know, even in his pro debut. And we know he's an athlete. So if he's an average left fielder, elite first baseman, splits time between the two, allows you to mix and match, and gives you a league average offense, that's a regular. So uh, this the contact skills you mentioned. I mean, you combine college and the pro debut, eighty eight percent zone contact, actually eighty nine percent zone contact. And I think there's enough juice there for 15 homers and he has some room to fill out. If he does that, I mean that there's a regular in there and yeah, it's not the desired impact for first base, but if you can spell that by putting him in left sometimes too, and he's able to give you a little bit of versatility and then the elite defense at first becomes a little bit more palatable when he's, you know, not slugging what we're used to at the position. Yeah. It feels like every organization in professional baseball has a guy that can go 25-25 in the minor leagues, but is striking out all the time. And Cam Meisner is that guy for the Tampa Bay Rays. He had a 2020 season, um, had an 800 OPS. Problem is, it comes with a ton of whiff. 36% K rate in Durham. Uh, I said looking more like the Sam Hilliard type than the Josh Lowe type. I think a lot of people wanted Josh Lowe out of Cam Meisner when that trade went down and he was a first round pick by Miami. Turns out he's he's another guy and that guy should get, you know, a, a couple of big league opportunities. Hilliard has gotten what I think three years of big league opportunities um, to be a guy that can hit the ball out of the ballpark, can swipe bags, but the K's are going to be really frustrating. 
Yeah, the the hope is, you know, you shelter him from lefties because lefties, he's, he was non-competitive. He hit 133 against lefties last year, uh, struck out 46% of the time. Oh. So against righties, 33% K rate, had an 890 OPS. The hope maybe is there that he can be that like platoon piece uh, and give you some thump and be a you know left-handed bat off the bench that can play all three outfield spots. Yeah, next one is one of the very few pitchers. Andrew Lindsay is a 24-year-old that, spent time at the complex this past year, but he was drafted out of Tennessee by the Marlins. Peter Bendix comes over. He ships Lindsay out of town for Vidal Brujan and Calvin Fauché. They ID'd a guy that I think is going to climb really quickly as a reliever. Lindsay has an outlier fastball, it seems, and his backstory is fascinating. It's linked in in the article. Um, Great job by one of the local affiliates of the USA Today kind of network, but Lindsay, he spent a couple years in junior college, then went to the University of Charlotte. They were having some program issues, so he leaves. He quits baseball. He goes home to help repair his hometown from insane flooding, is asked to coach a Little League team, coaches that Little League team, says, wait, I want to give this thing another shot. He goes and pitches in the Appy League. Tennessee buys in. Tony Vitello is like, come to Knoxville. He goes and he is the Friday guy in front of Chase Dolander the back half of the season. Like he is the running mate in the rotation with Dolander. And he was frankly better than Dolander last year at Tennessee. He yeah. profiled as a starter as like kind of that, I don't know, pitch to contact, ground ball oriented guy. But if he just lets the fastball eat and couples it with that slider, he can probably just be a rocket ship through the affiliates. Yeah. Also, you just, spurred a thought in my mind of a happy college baseball opening day to everybody out oh, there yeah. that's have been tuned in just saw Santucci shove uh for yes. duke so we'll, we'll be the mock draft is out by the way as well so go check that out uh you know on just baseball.com but we'll be talking about college baseball next week as well i want to talk about uh of course japanese superstar going over to, to stanford yeah. uh, i think that's, that's extremely exciting too so stuff a lot of stuff to unpack there on the college baseball side we promise we'll have you covered um and that might be some more bonus content weekend episode stuff which we're also going to be rolling out starting next week as well um and i think those bonus episodes will have some more college baseball stuff sprinkled into that as well but to to circle back on Lindsay, super unique release really low it's like a 4.9 foot release once he went professional uh they kind of tweaked it a little bit and he gets crazy arm side run i I think it makes for a really uncomfortable at bat for righties and then he has this this devastating you know breaking ball that just tunneling off of that is just an opposite action nightmare. Um, so I, I think can be a devastating reliever to to righties specifically. And uh, I, like you mentioned, can climb quickly and just fits the raise mold, right? Right, right slider, throw, throws weird. They want different looks. Lindsay gives them exactly that. I, they found Kevin Kelly last year in the Rule 5 draft. It, it trades, I think, I think Colorado picked up Kelly and then they traded for him. But like, he may be the next Kevin Kelly. He doesn't throw as weird as Kelly, but the characteristics are kind of similar to Kevin Kelly. Yeah, um, Greg Jones, a little bit. yeah, stuff is probably a little bit better. Um, Greg Jones, next guy, he's about to turn 26 years old. He has game changing speed and he is a high efficiency base dealer. He's not getting on base enough, he's not slugging enough. And again, he's just jammed. If he's in Oakland, he was playing 100 games last year. I promise you that. But Durham is as good a team perennially as, as we've got in triple a ball and Greg Jones is kind of a big part of that. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you want to be patient with the Greg Jones switch hitter, great, great speed actually hits the ball sneaky hard and just such an explosive 26. athlete, but yeah, it's like, okay, how much longer can we, can we wait here? I think we're right up about at that at, at the end there, right. Of like how much longer we can, you know, wait for this, you know, to, to work out. Yeah. But, um, I want to I want to see him just get an opportunity and see what it all looks like. But and again, another super utility, explosive type of guy. Sam Hilliard is, seems to be the comp for these types. But there's a reason why we repeat ourselves sometimes some of these systems because there's there's a type and and the Rays definitely love those athletes, even if you know the, the field of hit isn't always there. Speaking of athlete, Brock Jones, former Stanford football safety, turned. Uh, Really good college baseball player, OPS over 1,100 in his draft year. You know, he's one of those guys that everybody probably ID'd based on the stature alone as someone that, oh, once he commits to baseball full-time, he's going to take off. It's what we're doing with 
Brody Brecht at Iowa right now. Oh, he puts the football down and like time to go. He's a rocket ship. Hasn't been the case with Brock Jones. He's punching out 33% of the time. Um, he hit 201 last year. Like you can't be a top 15 prospect, regardless of how washboard your abs are, if you hit 201. And <laughs> that unfortunately is is where we're going with Jones. He looks like, yeah, he can you know, cheat to get to power, but is he yeah. fine-tuned enough hand-eye wise, just your ball player wise, to be a top 15 prospect? You hit the nail on the head, and, and I'm concerned that the answer is no. Um, I, yeah, I didn't love him coming out of the draft, but I can understand the the, the upside play, and and you know the Rays are always interested in that kind of upside play sometimes in the in, in the second round, which is funny because they end up going the other way um, this past draft and, and taking Ledbetter, who we'll talk about in a little bit, um, which right. is the, kind of the opposite type of profile. Uh, but you know, I can understand trying to take a shot here on, on a player like Jones. He's still got time, and, and you know maybe he can refine some things, but. He's kind of one of those guys where you almost just want to start from square one and just like scrap the swing, start over yeah, and, yeah. and see what it can look like after that. And and I'm very curious to see what what he's going to look like coming back this year because it's got to look different. Yeah, it it's a scary to. project, too. Yeah. Uh, two more guys, yeah. both outfielders. Drew Baker, I really fell in love with during this process. Uh, 23 year old was taken out of Texas Tech. He was awesome at Texas Tech in 2021. Hit. 340, high efficiency base dealer, really hurt in 2022, only played 47 games, but in 2023 hit over 300, OBP'd over 380, slugged nearly 500, and he's still 49 bags and 54 attempts between high yeah. A and double A. He was not outmatched at any level that he was at, had 14 homers. Assume that ticks down to like 10 at the major league level, but he screams fourth outfielder with a chance for more because he played all three outfield spots. If he could play a good center field, he's probably a top 15 prospect, but it's a stable center field in a good corner. And I agree like with the profile and everything, it's like, okay, you got a fourth outfielder here, but generally you want those types to be really good defensively in center because the bat's good. Like he's made decent contact. You know, when you look at the underlying stuff, the, the EVs are are good enough for his type of profile. Um, yes, he puts the ball on the ground, but that's okay when you're that fast. It's not an egregious ground ball, right? Like everything is fine in the offensive profile. And like you mentioned, he sneaks out enough home runs to where, you know, he's not going to be a, a 300 slugging guy, but I would just like, like, I feel like this kind of profile, you need to go get it in center. Maybe you can develop a little bit further out there, but regardless, um, it, 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 there's a big leaguer here one way or another, I think. And it, it's going to be interesting to see how it, how it all comes together. Yeah. Last guy, if you were to artificially manufacture the best showcase player you've ever seen, <laughs> oh, he's might awesome. I point you to Mason Hour? Uh, evaluators would drool over this guy in a 40 yard dash in outfield just throw velocity and like exit velo and around a BP. The, the problem for our this year, which was not a problem in 2022, he would have been a top 10 prospect in the system if he repeated 22, I'm sure. Punched out 36% of the time. Like he looked lost yeah. this past year. Mm -hmm. If he can mm -hmm. recapture any of his production from 22, the tools are out the ass with Mason Hour. He's so fun to watch, man. It's it it, it gives uh, Tyler O'Neill in terms of like the the tools, this the the physicality, uh, the swing and miss. Uh, but <laughs> it did get a little bit better for him once the tacked balls were out of circulation. Final fifty games, he cut that strikeout rate down to thirty one percent, posted a seven seventy OPS. This is a guy though that was a JUCO player, right? And and yeah. yes, he he hit the ground running in uh, the lower levels and. Double A's a ringer, man, especially with the with the, the experimental baseballs. I'm I'm not gonna give up on him yet. I definitely was bullish on him and was surprised to see the struggles uh to this degree, but I still think that there's potential here for enough hit for the rest of the tools to shine through. He he hasn't even turned 23 yet. So there, there's enough to to like here. And uh, I think you gotta give him at least another year in double A. For sure. Couple other names, real quick. To just just didn't quite make the like write up cut, but I do think just in the system are are, are fascinating. Ben Peoples is probably going to carve out a, a big league reliever role. Just some interesting you know data on, on his stuff. Uh, Jacob Lopez had a really nice year. Southpaw uh, 
great numbers in the upper minors, even got a taste of the big leagues. Uh, nothing really jumps off the page. It's it's deception. And, you know, I don't I think he's going to be more of just a fill in, you know, innings eater type of guy at, at least. And then or at most probably. And then Cole Wilcox, I, I just think he's trending towards the, the non prospect range at this point. But he is still a prospect. Uh it's given up some of the hardest hit balls I've seen uh, over the last year. Fastball is very flat, but there's good enough secondary stuff. Hopefully, he can you know develop enough to be you know that that fill in type guy as well. And then Shane Sasaki, uh, just a really good athlete. Uh, we'll see how the bat comes along, but it's it, he's put up decent numbers enough, and and can absolutely fly and go get it in the outfield. One more and guy more, that I've also talking. one more that yeah okay oh, sorry so go two ahead two more guys. No, Seymour, Seymour was TJ guy that bounced back, looked awesome, but he's older for the kind of the rehabbing ascension that he was making. This is going to be his healthy year where he faces competition that, you know, he's probably in line with. Another guy is Marcus Johnson. Yeah, 20, we should probably throw him. Season. We should probably throw yeah. him in there, to be honest. Yeah, so Marcus Johnson, 23-year-old in, in low A this past year, so he was like much older than the level. Um he had an ERA in the, in the mid to high threes, but this guy walked 21 guys in 130 innings. He's going to put the ball anywhere he wants. The command is excellent. Problem is like pitch by pitch. It doesn't seem like it's, you know, swing and miss type stuff at the major league level. Not, not quite, but he's six, six. You wonder if they can tinker with some things, get him right. Uh, he's definitely a guy that we should have in the names to watch. So we'll throw him in there. I'm glad you mentioned him. He does get some surprisingly decent chase numbers. So I, I wonder if he, it has a little bit of a tunneling effect there. And uh, I, there's enough there where, where he's the top 20 prospect probably in the system. And you can hope that he grows into a little bit more uh, velocity. But yeah, he, he's definitely a guy that the, right now the stuff just isn't quite good enough to where it probably profiles as like a fringe five starter. But if you can see an uptick, you could see maybe a, a solid five starter um, with maybe potential for a little bit more than that. So we go into number 15 here, and it's Ronnie Simon. And we've talked about Ronnie Simon a bunch over the last couple of years. And now he's a player that I think if you look at a couple other prospect outlets, he might not even be ranked. But I think if you look at prospectus, I think they might even have him at number 11. Uh, Ronnie Simon, I, I no doubt think is a top 30 prospect in the system. And obviously, I think he's a top 15 prospect in the system. He's gone nuts in the in the light on this year. I think he's had a really nice stretch out there. but. That, that's not even why I have him ranked here. This is a good player, and he's a guy that I think is going to have a big league role one way or another. It was a little bit of a frantic game that that you would see when, when he played in, in the last couple of years where it was super high chase. Um, it just seemed like he was going 1,000 miles an hour all the time, even at shortstop and at the plate and on the bases, whatever. It was just the way he played, for better and for worse. But this past year – Refine the approach a little bit, cut down on the chase a ton, and walked at the highest clip of his career, 11% walk rate. He's only 5'9", but he hits the crap out of the ball. Like He packs a punch for his frame. Exit velocities that are a, a smidge above average. He's got a 90th percentile right around 104. Um, that's not going to translate into average game power. It's probably going to still be fringy at you know, best, 10 to 15 home runs. But it does help when you have that raw power to be able to – you know, have a higher bat, to be able to sneak more balls through the infield and more, be able to split the gap more frequently. You're just naturally, you hit the ball harder, you're going to hit for a higher average. So even though it's not turning into 20 homers, still turning into 10 to 15 and, and, and more doubles. Now that he's walking more, he's not really a shortstop, but he can get by there. Uh, there's, the range is fine, but the arm is, is kind of fringy, can play a good second base, can play a passable short, can play a passable third. And in the light of him, he's been playing left. So he becomes a super utility switch hitter type the right-handed swing has come along a lot. He's a good runner. You can steal some bags. He's a well-rounded player that I think can be a super utility type. And uh, I'm surprised to not see him ranked, you know, on, on the top 30 more. I know he wasn't protected in the rule five and didn't get selected, which was pretty shocking to me, but yeah. you know, I, I, that's not going to skew my ranking. I, that's what I would have picked him. So I still like him here at the 15 spot. Yeah. So he just seemed more big league ready than a Nassim Nunez who went mm -hmm. and, and Nas is awesome, but like there's I a chance that. Nas doesn't hit at the major league level. Ronnie yeah. Simon, you know, is going to hit enough at the major league level. And that's probably why Eric Neander felt fine moving off of Vidal Brujan because you're running out of opportunities for Brujan. And now it turns into a toss up between Ronnie Simon and a Slavis Basabe. If you need a bat in the lineup every day at a second base, 
it's probably Simon. The, the mm-hmm. separator between Simon and Basabe is Basabe can play a good short and Simon can play an adequate short. So yeah. edge Basabe, surely, but situationally, there may be a chance for Ronnie Simon to usurp Oslebis Basabe. No doubt. And I think what he's doing, and you know, again, we don't try to put too much value into the lineup, but you know, th- that is the one spot if we're gonna look at all the winter leagues that stands out more than the others. And he's going, he's doing great out there while playing a new position. And I I do think that's important. So that's the thing, man. Like if you're young and not good out there, try not to place much stock. But if you're young and good out there, yeah. like, dude, that's a bonus. It it's really a can't lose situation. Yeah, if you it's, go it's and a play with thing. You know, it's a great point because it's like Look, if they struggle, yeah, it's an unfamiliar environment, whatever. But if they're putting up numbers, it's like, you know, they're playing a lot of tough competition there. He got better as the season went on, too. So he kind of carried that momentum, right? He, he had better numbers in AAA and then carried that right into this winter league. So I, I expect Simon to get up to the big leagues this year. And you know, I think he's going to be able to carve out a little role in this utility bench type. And I think he's going to have a better big league career than Vidal Brujan. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if the uh, if the Rays agree. Uh, based on you know the way that they kind of handled uh, that situation between the two. Number 14 is a guy that look, we're not going to be able to talk too much about, but there's just been enough flashes that you can you can dream on him enough to have him in the top 15. Braylor Guerrero, one of the top IFA targets in the 2023 class, signed for $3.7 million, which is only the fifth highest in that class, which is a testament to how insane that class was. Uh, but Guerrero, he only played a handful of games. And then went down with a shoulder issue that he actually ended up needing to get surgery for. So I am curious to see how he comes back from that and and, and how the swing looks and you know if everything looks you know comfortable because it does take some guys some time to get right you know after a, a shoulder issue with their swing. But Guerrero, we got our first little taste of just those handful of games. And as a 16 year old, he was putting up exit velocities of, of 109. Uh, and for a guy that's as physical as he is, it's it's a pretty I wouldn't say fluid, but it's not stiff. Usually guys that are that strong and that built at that age, you know, we talk about like Lazaro Montes, he does a good job of avoiding too much stiffness for how strong he is. I think Guerrero, it's the same thing. He avoids too much stiffness. I am worried, you know, after the injury, if if, if you lose some of that fluidity, we'll see. But hitting the ball as hard as he did, already having a pretty good feel for the strike zone. I actually like his moves in the box already. He's got a plus arm that'll play in a corner, so he's not some positionless guy either. Um, we got to see more. I'm not going to pretend to have a ton on him, but from what I was able to see and what we know, uh, too good of a player to, you know, upside-wise to, to not be in the top 15. I know nothing about him, but I agree with you. Based on what I've read, big money, big pop, it works. Dude, I mean – when you're hitting the ball 109 miles an hour before your 17th birth. Yeah. Like the alien and it, it, from the left side with, with a pretty yeah. clean swing. Like I, I want to find out more. You're going to make this list. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Number 13, a guy that we've talked a bit about. It feels like he's had a little bit of a fall from grace because of how highly regarded he was in the early parts of his professional career. But Mason Montgomery left-handed pitcher, was drafted in the sixth round out of Texas Tech in 2021 by Tampa and just came out guns a blazing, right? Like just, yeah. just I wouldn't say overpowering because that's not what he does, but just bullying uh, some of the lower level hitters. Just, just they didn't really, they hadn't really seen much like Mason Montgomery because it was three pitches for a strike, deception, and a a hoppy fastball. Then he gets to Double A and still succeeds, but you know the numbers naturally aren't as dominant. And then got a taste of Triple A at the end of the year. Still put up good numbers, though. And Montgomery was a tough guy to peg for me here because I think you could push him up even higher. Uh, but, you know, the the upside of some of these other guys kind of gave them the edge. But Montgomery, I feel pretty confident, can kind of be that sixth slash fifth starter. And I think could potentially even settle in as a big league five because you have that fastball in the low 90s. It used to be, you know, more in the upper 80s to 90. Now ticking up to, to more 91, 93 with the 18, 19 inches of ride helps a ton. He exclusively goes out of the stretch. And and that's because I think he's able to replicate his deception that way. He comes set like about six inches, like closed his front foot, about six inches in front of his back foot and hides the ball so well. And then just uncorks that fastball that I think gets on hitters quicker. Then he has a slider that's more of like a gyro short cutterish slider. It's like a gyro slider really though. But it, in, in a vacuum, probably uh, an average pitch at best, but plays up off of 
that fastball and with the deception, how hard it is to pick the ball up out of his hand with the gyro break. You have the carry and then the the, the bite on that slider. And then he'll mix in a change of kind of the same story in a vacuum, probably an average pitch at best plays up because of the way that it works off of his release point in his fastball. I, I actually, this was a specific player where I, I would text Griffin after, cause he had to face him a bunch. And I was yeah. just like, what's the deal with this guy? You know, I'm, I'm looking at the data. It's not that great, but you know, I just see all the uncomfortable swings and he's just like, dude, it's really hard to pick up. It's really hard to separate. And especially that slider from the last like 15 feet, it's really difficult to be able to tell what's what. Um, and he said the whole lineup kind of shared that same sentiment when he's not on with the slider, then that's where you see those, those outings where he gets kind of bludgeoned. Cause yeah, it's a decent fastball, but when I know, okay, I just need to get to the top of a 92 mile an hour fastball, Look, it's, yeah. it's got ride, but you know, guys can get to that once you know that that's all he's got. Um, so that's the one side of it. He doesn't have as much of a margin for error, but knowing that hitters just struggle to differentiate it, you can really see it when you watch the video too. The the other thing that jumped out to me was the command dissipated a little bit this year in the upper minors, but the, the big fly. like I found that very interesting that the home run rate nearly doubled and he did a great job at limiting homers in 2022. It was... Let's see, 124 innings, 11 home runs. But then same output, 124 and a third. So we got one more out in 2023 than it did in 22. But that homer number jumped from 11 to 20. So Mm -hmm. I wonder if that was, hey, didn't have his slider, it's bombs away at that point. The other thing that you got to note is he made four starts in AAA. 13 Ks, 11 walks. So he, he clearly was nibbling. And like, yeah, you're 92. You've got a three pitch mix. You've got to trust your three pitch mix in the strike zone. And it seemed mm-hmm. like this year was kind of the first time that he didn't trust his three pitch mix in the strike zone. He got drafted. He went to the complex, 20 punch outs, one walk. Like yeah. it was ridiculous. And then high A, double A, it was awesome in 22. Then he sees competition that is adequate to him, like that is on his level. And he, it just seemed like he started to nibble and he got burned. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you got to trust it, right? Like you, like you said, you, you can't walk guys when you know that, you know, with, with a, with a ride riding fastball, you're going to give up homers from time to time. you got to live and die by that. And if you start nibbling, start walking guys, those home runs are going to burn you a lot worse. Then there's so, three run homers, right? They're not solo shots. Garrett Cole won a Cy Young f- based on solo shots. Yep. So yeah. that's, that's where it's got to be. And, and again, just being able to talk to other hitters too, like that's a lefty and Griffin, but I talked to righties and he's the same thing. Like I couldn't really pick up the change up and I know change ups are hard by nature, but they're, it's extra difficult with him. Got to trust that. And if it's if guys aren't, you know, as fooled, uh, you got to live and die by that. I mean, that, that's what it's going to be. You can't walk guys. If, if, if you're Mason Montgomery and I, I think maybe the ABS maybe played a little bit of a part in that too, um, combined yeah. with the, the trusting the stuff in triple A. The guy who has pounded the strike zone so far as a pro is Santiago Suarez, who came over from the Marlins to the Rays in that Xavier Edwards, JT Chagua shot, uh, swap there. Um, that This was a, the second that this trade went down. I was like, damn, I know exactly why the Rays identified this guy. Because when he was 18 years old, just, just looking so advanced at the complex, filling up the zone, uh, I mean, dominating at, at the lower levels. Um, specific, specifically at the complex, pitched to a one one three ERA in 39 and two-thirds innings in the Florida Complex League, uh, just getting his feet wet with the Rays, and then got promoted up to, to low A before his 19th birthday where he he held his own as well. The the stuff is is okay, and I think that's the question here is, you know, how much more is in there? 6'2", 200 pounds, could probably tap into a little bit more velocity, but he's a crossfire guy where you really see like, you know, he does throw across his body and there's some dead, like the fastball flirts with the dead zone, but it is 93 to 95 and his ability to locate it helps a ton because yes, it flirts with the dead zone, but he's able to really wear out the bottom of the zone and hit his spots strike rate of 74% on the fastball um, this past year. And then the curveballs uh, flashes plus change up flashes, at least average for, for a third pitch. If, if he can kind of refine that. The command being plus, I think, gives him a chance to, you know, be an everyday starter or like a, a starter every fifth day, I should say. But, you know, I don't know if there's enough stuff, raw stuff there to be much more than a a four or five starter. I tell you what, though, I'm going to bet on an 18 year old that doesn't walk people 
and you know, like never really gets outside of himself. And and it's one thing if he wasn't walking anybody and he was sitting 89. He's mid 90s. And, you know, like dead zone, yes. If there's any organization in baseball that can work on pitch shape, yeah, it's this organization. So like they'll figure out two <laughs> to make data darlings. And yes. then it's like, okay, well, you know, he's got the command already. So that is like, and, and we've talked about this. That is becoming the thing that I deem unteachable. Command. Feel for yeah. the strikes. And darn he's clearly got it when he's a teenager. Yeah, you don't find many, many teenagers throwing in the mid-90s, whether the shape is there or not, and, and filling up the zone like that. So Suarez is definitely uh, a guy that could have plenty of helium with a few tweaks and can do a lot of the unteachable. That's why the Marlins shelled out you know, 385000 to sign him in 21. Number 11 is a guy that's a total opposite. If you could put Yaniel Curé, is it Curet or Curé? I want to say it's Curet, but it's probably Curet. Curet. Let's just say Curet. Let's just say Curet. Um, if you could combine him and Suarez, you you could probably have a top pitching prospect. <laughs> but yeah, because Curet, 70 fastball. He averaged 97 miles an hour. And, and you know, he wasn't going six, seven innings to start, but he, he, he wasn't going one inning spurts out of the pen. He was going three, four innings. Um, it's got life to it, too. And it's from a you know a, a release where he gets yeah he gets that ride it's it's high spin and just explodes through the zone thirty five percent in zone whiff rate on his fastball just bullying guys with that uh, then you have the slider working off of that which is dirty that's also a potentially plus pitch and then his changeup which I, I think gets ignored he started to throw that pitch more and more as the season went on and it's pretty nasty and it, it was around the zone enough. That three pitch mix is enough to make him a, a decent starter, but the problem is the command is is well below average. He walked a lot of hitters, but if he can even get the command to be below average, <laughs> I think the stuff is good enough to potentially be able to go three, four, five innings, be a five and dive type guy. Um, so they're they're going to give him every opportunity to start. Uh, but and there's a reason why they added him to the forty man roster. But yeah. man, like. The stuff is, it's the best stuff in the system, I'd argue. Uh, but yeah, you, you, you got to be able to uh, get it in the zone a little bit more. But you got a, a 70 grade pitch, a 60 grade pitch, and potentially an above average third offering. He's a lot thicker than you would expect at those measurements. You got him at 6'1, 200. Like a lot of that weight's in his lower half. And he is impressive to watch. And you would think like, oh, electric stuff can't find the zone. I close my eyes and I think lanky dude that like arms are flying everywhere. And somehow he's snapping off ridiculous stuff. No, he's kind of a fire hydrant. And and he is yeah. directing all that weight towards home plate. And it is exploding out of his hand. And that fastball, like it just looks better than every hitter that he saw. It, it, and it was, <laughs> you know, like he just overpowered guys. and. The fact that he has the finesse to like start to throw the changeup a little bit better as the season went on and, and does snap that slider pretty well. I have some hope that he can develop the command a little bit more. He, he was 20 last year. He'll, he'll be 21 for the duration of this season. So I, I still have some optimism there. But here's the thing. If, if Kirit goes to the, the, the bullpen, he's a high lever. He's got closer stuff. And I'm imagining this guy in one inning spurts, he's probably hitting triple digits all the time. Um, so if he does move to the bullpen, he's he's a closer and or at least a really good eighth inning guy, and he's going to be a problem. Opponents hit a buck forty nine against him. It's a classic. Biggest challenge for him is going to be himself. Uh, but yes. I mean, we even saw stretches. I mean, he's striking everybody out. Even when he had bad outings, he was striking dudes out like in droves. So even when he gets up to high A, tons of strikeouts, still was able to get through three and two thirds, four innings. I think that there's a chance he can start, which makes him intriguing enough. Okay, so if he does make the move to the pen, you want him or Abner Uribe? I'm still going to take Uribe because he's just an alien freak show. Yeah, it's but one. Or I think two he can have that better. Uribe progression because it might look like that out of the pen. Yeah, but that's a good question. That's exactly who I thought of when I'm like, all right, if it moves to the pen, if he moves to the pen, it's it, it's, it's, it's a Uribe wipeout shit. Yeah. Which will be a lot of fun. Number 10. I know one of your favorites, Jack. It's funny because we've talked about him now like in two different systems because of the trade. Uh, so we don't need to spend too much time because we talked about him in the Dodgers system. And then we talked about him when the trade went down. And now we're going to talk about him again. Johnny DeLuca, 
He'll graduate from the prospect rankings very quickly. Uh, it's going to be on the big league squad. Of course, included in the Tower Glass now trade. Just his high, just high, high floor, right? Like a guaranteed bench piece. I think can, at the very least, be a short platoon guy. Hits lefties really, really well. Can play all three outfield spots in an above average level. Is a plus runner and an above average field to hit. The power is fringy, but he taps into every bit of it because of his ability to lift and, and lift to the pull side. It's like Isak Paredes in that regard, where he's just able to hit way more home runs than you'd expect from the, the batted ball data. He did do that in the PCL though. So it'll be interesting to see if he does that now, you know, in, in more normal environments, but he did show the ability to elevate and generate backspin and get balls out to the pull side. If he hits 15 home runs, he could be a regular. So like, I'm not ruling out an average regular here, uh, but I do think at the very least, you got a good platoon piece and fourth outfielder. I thought Tampa did really well in that glass now trade because obviously Pepio flashed way better stuff than we were expecting him to really ever flash. He lost a ton of weight going into last year and he d- he looked way better last year. DeLuca is another one that I kind of viewed as like the Kmart James Outman. And guess what? James Outman's a four or five win player every year. Like he's going to strike out 34% of the time and he's going to put up a four and a half win season. That's pretty much what he did last year. Yeah. That's kind of how I view DeLuca with way less swing and miss. And and yeah. Outman has the louder tools and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, this guy runs really well. And he hits homers, like you mentioned. It's it's pull side. You know, he can backspin him out. But I think the point that I made during the Dodgers top prospect episode was you hit 25 homers, you hit 25 homers. We, we have to respect that. Yeah. And he's going to find a way to hit the ball over any fence. That's um, I think I mentioned it. A couple of months ago, like that's what I've heard about Chris Bryant as as he was making his way through, and like all the yeah, his time EVs were never great. No, his EVs were never great, and his batting practice—you don't show up early to go watch Chris Bryant take batting practice. He's not sending balls, and in Chicago, he wasn't sending balls on a wavelength. He just found a way to hit it just over the fence, and he did that thirty times in a given yeah. year. So, I I do think that can be Deluca, where he finds a way to hit the ball over a fence twenty five times in a season. And if he does that, then then he's an every he's an above average regular, and I you know that's the probably the peak outcome, but it's 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 in there, it's possible. Um, he's gonna have to really make a lot of contact, and that's the underrated part about those profiles is like with with an outman, it's he just hits the ball so hard that he can hit it out you know to all parts of the field and and just right. crushes balls. Um, but that comes with a ton of whiff. With a Deluca, it's like you can only really hit the ball out consistently one way. And you got to be able to stick to an approach that allows you to hunt those pitches like Isak Paredes does, right? Um, and if you don't get that pitch, how can you still salvage in that bat, grind, you know, spoil them, draw a walk, or or shoot a hit the other way? Uh, I think he can do that, though, because he does adjust with two strikes. He, he does have the good bat-to-ball skills. So you know, I wouldn't rule out a, a regular here at, at all. Yeah. Number nine, Oslevis Basabe, who can – Play all over the infield. And I think it's going to have a pretty prominent role with the Rays this year, uh, considering you know their needs and and specifically at shortstop. And I think Basabe is going to give them a good defensive shortstop with Taylor Walls out and and Caminero probably sliding over to third. And uh, if well, depending on what they do with Paredes, it looks like they keep him. So I, I don't know what what they're going to do, but Basabe should have a role one way or another with this team and and should kind of be in this utility fill in type position. And I think he can do well in it. He didn't have a great debut. Um, and I think part of that's because of how aggressive he is. And that's going to be something that could hold him back. But he does have plus bat to ball skills. He does hit the ball hard enough. Um, you know, it, he's not going to ever hit for a ton of power, but he hits the ball hard enough to be, you know, a consistent player and above average run can steal some bags. You know, when you can play several positions well, you make a lot of contact and you hit the ball hard enough. It, it's just a really safe and solid player. Are you worried at all? that he could turn into that quad a type of guy where he's just kind of shuttling back and forth and he never really produces enough to warrant an everyday role. That's my worry with him. It's like, okay, this guy's going to be a bench bat for the next three years. I'm nervous about that because of the approach um, and because of how much he puts the ball on the ground. Um, it, It seems like the guys with the high ground ball rates and high chase are the guys that end up going back and forth a lot. That's why I look at like Bruhan, right? Like uh, the approach really is what did him in and has continued to do him in. 
and that's what I'm worried about with with Basabe is, you know, are you are you going to be able to cut down on that chase? Are you going to be able to to refine your approach? Um, so no, it, it is definitely a concern. Um, but he does a lot of things pretty well. Yes. And if he can just refine that approach, he's 23. We'll see. But you know, I'm, I'm losing patience a little bit, you know, when, when it comes to cutting down on that chase. And I think if there's not much of a tangible change this year, uh, you probably have to reassess, you know, what, what the chances are of him being, you know, an everyday player. But there is a ton of value in the versatility that he brings. And I, I think what you're hoping for is, and he, he's not going to walk as much as Donovan, but like you're hoping for a Donovan where it's very minimal power output, but he plays well everywhere. Yeah. And I mean, this guy's chasing as much as he does and he's striking out less than 15% of the time, even including the big league stint. And yeah, yeah you mentioned playing everywhere and playing a solid shortstop too. So, right. and being able to steal bags. So we'll see yeah, how it all comes together. Yeah. That, that's the difference for me with utility prospects. It's like, okay, you play everywhere. Do you play a good everywhere? And and for a lot of guys, the answer is no, you just play everywhere. Like <laughs> You play an yeah. okay everywhere. If you can play a good everywhere, your value increases by, by double. And he plays a good yeah. everywhere on the infield. And he's got enough juice to to hit a lot of doubles and sneak out a handful of home runs. And 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 I think that's that's a part of it that's that's important. So we'll see if he cuts down on the chase. And I think if he cuts down on the chase, naturally the ground ball rate will, will cut down as well. So uh still a guy that I, I have some optimism on. Yeah. Number eight. Adrian Santana, a guy that we're not going to have too much on, but I will tell you this was a really fun defensive dive. Uh, comp A pick for them, 31st overall in the 2023 draft out of South Florida, Miami kid. Um, good bloodlines. I think his, his father played up to double A. His, his brother might still be playing professionally or, or formerly did. Um, there's, there's, You can see. Uh, you remember how we were talking about you can just tell the guys that have grown up around the game, you know, and, and, and Santana is just, just one of those as well, where um, the way that he plays shortstop seems like he's been playing shortstop for 30 years, uh, how natural it is, uh, how he comes in and, and picks balls on a short hop, um, how he reads the hops, his footwork, how he puts himself in position to make plays. Uh, the arm is above average. The speed is plus plus, And you see that with the way that he's able to move his feet out there and, and cover ground. Um, and, and just the comfort of being able to make these tough throws and and co confidence in you know making plays from tough positions and it just seems like he feels like he can make every single play. Uh, so I, I think the floor is already elevated for him, even though the offense is is, is really questionable uh, at this point, right? It's he's a switch hitter with with a right handed swing that's ahead of his left handed swing. Uh, does have some good bats of ball skills, but definitely needs to add a lot of strength. Definitely needs to refine the left handed swing and clean up the path and increase the bat speed, but good there's there's a decent feel for the barrel when you have 70 wheels and project as, as a plus defensive shortstop and and it is i think you could even be a little bit better than that uh that that's a good prospect especially as a switch hitter so he hopped on the bump at a perfect game showcase in july of 2019 he topped at 67 feel terrible about that but good news is he's hit puberty since then what do you think his 60 yard dash time was clock july of 2022 6 Four. Six one six. Holy crap. Speedster. That's double plus. That is crazy. That's like that's one of the better numbers I've ever seen. Six that's one actually, six. Yeah. yeah. So you go those wheels and then everything that I just ranted about defensively. And it's just like it, it be, it be, if you're a league average hitter, which you know it's it's a long way from where he's at right now, but if he becomes a league average hitter, I mean this is a above average everyday shortstop. So we'll have to wait and see more. I, I am interested to see if they assign him to low A or, or keep him at the complex. I think he should stay at the complex to start the year. Uh, and that's what I think they'll ultimately do. But this is a, a fun player to follow because you know the glove is so damn good that the bat you know, takes a lot of pressure off the bat and could end up being good enough. Uh, and there's some projection there physically. Yeah. Number seven, one of my favorite sleepers in the draft. I didn't even think he was that much of a sleeper, but – Get picked 55th overall. I, I thought he was a borderline first round talent. Colton Ledbetter, outfielder out of Mississippi State, who transferred from Samford, put up good numbers at Samford, and then put up even better numbers at Mississippi State. And, and I, I, I was pretty surprised to see him fall to 55. And I know that the Rays were probably amped to get him. Nothing jumps off the page here, right? It's kind of 50s or slightly better across the board. 
but he's a gamer with 50s across the board, and he has hit at every single stop. He doesn't have the Cape Cod League performance to 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 reference because you didn't get to play out there but he played in the NECBL swinging with wood for Newport and put up some of the best numbers in the league out there which still you know that matters you're swinging with wood and there was impact with wood um he's 6'2 205 plays a good corner can play a, a passable maybe even average center field and just kind of gets the most out of his average tools across the board you can't really find a hole in his game it's a sweet swing from the left side I just think this is a really safe and well-rounded player and uh, he could grow into a little bit more power. It wouldn't shock me if he ends up being, you know, as good as, you know, Braden Taylor and they end up kind of being one A and one B from that draft class. So have you ever seen a 50 runner with as like efficient base stealing numbers as him across the board? Like this guy was never getting caught. He was always swiping 15 or more bags at, at each level, whether it was, you know, any of his previous stops in college before Mississippi state, it's, it's, Really so, incredible. You know what the answer to that question is? Number yes. six. Okay. Same there same thing, go. which is really funny. But no, it, that's kind of the point, right? You, you're you're nailing it, which is he gets the most out of everything here, right? Like he he is able to play an above average corner. If if we were ranking him defensively as you know the field grade, if he was just a left fielder slash right fielder, would be like 50 55. He's 40 present, 50 future as a center fielder because that's what they're going to try to do. It's getting more action out there. But yeah, I mean, the efficiency and the base stealing, uh, the field of hit being what it is, the power flashing at least average. I think there might be a little bit more in there. Um, and and just a, a good field to hit that is adjustable. Uh, he's an ath- a really athletic guy in the box. I think Ledbetter is, is really, was really slept on and continues to be and, and is a good piece. Uh, for the Rays to be able to get at 55 overall, then can climb the minors relatively quickly and, um, you know, kind of be that classic 270, hits you 15 home runs, plays good defense, steals 10 to 15 bags. You're know, like, that's just a really solid player all the way around. And uh, he's a, you know, two to three win guy. But I, I think there's a little bit more upside than that. I just took a look at uh, at the baseball reference at number six. And yeah, you're right. Higher efficiency base. Yeah. Okay. They go back to back with high efficiency base stealers, and that takes us to number six, Braden Taylor. Uh, Taylor, first round pick, 19th overall out of TCU, and kind of a different pick from the Rays. Generally, we we see them go in a different route, but I think they really like the hit tool that, that Taylor has, and it's always been hit over power for him. Then he added some more power in, in that junior season. The EVs jumped, um, and the output jumped. And this is another guy. The Rays just seem to do a really good job at identifying this. Is I think they see a lot of teams out there hunting EVs and translating EVs to power projection. And I think they're finding some diamonds in the rough of guys that maybe aren't data darlings in the exit velocity department, but have a natural ability to create leverage and and sneak balls out to the pole side and and and, and you know produce enough home runs. Braden Taylor's EVs, even with the jump in, in his junior year, were still not that great, but the way he's able to get into his pull side power, the way he's able to backspin baseballs like the aforementioned players, you know, we talked about like Paredes and, and guys like that. Um, I, I think lends reason to believe that he can have average power at the highest level. And then the hit tool, it, it's, it's always been there for him. So you have above average hit, you have average power, and then you have a, a really good approach ability to walk, uh, can play a decent third and second base. They might even try him at shortstop a little bit. We'll see how that goes. Um, and then average runner, but an incredibly efficient base stealer. What was he? 36 of, of 40 at, at TCU. And then I think he was what? 12 of 12 last year. So it, it's yeah. just really solid. He was 39 of 40 at TCU. 39 of 40. He was 39 of 40 yeah. and 11 for 11 in his first 25 games. Um, the, the thing that gets me is the 23 homers. Yeah. He had 13, 12 his freshman year. 13 his sophomore year, 23 his junior year. And then he had five in 25 games in Pro Bowl. So like this guy's clearly leveling up in the power department. You give me a guy with innate feel for playing baseball and you tell me that he's going to get stronger and stronger and stronger and more powerful and more powerful. And I'm putting all my money into that guy. Yeah, and I like the nuance to his swing. Like the, it's It's a unique move that... Yeah, I can tell why he does it. So he, he actually starts his swing. Usually guys start their swing with a hand load in tandem with, with the leg kick, right, or with the stride. And with him, the leg goes by itself. And then as the leg's about to come down, he pulls his hands backwards. So usually that 
would kind of create a situation for hitters where their upper body and lower body would kind of be out of sync. But for him, he yeah. stays in sync. And, and that hand movement backwards while his leg goes forwards, I think really helps him it kind of negate the forward move and stay back. Um, and, and doing that, kind of creating this stretch and this rubber band effect. Um, you know, of course, a lot of hitters have a, a negative move when they they stride. But with with Taylor, it's so blatant where the leg starts and then when it's coming down, that's when he starts his hand load. Um, and it's just a straight pull uh, you know, backwards. It seems like that really allows him to stay back and and create loft in the swing and create backspin and really generate, I think, some some good angles to the pull side. And that's why the Rays seem to find the guys that outslug their EVs. And I think Taylor is just another example of that. There's a guy that's outslugging his EVs. And I think he's going to continue to do that. But you look at his frame, you can see room for more strength. And as you mentioned, if he grows into more strength, um, then he could ha- potentially have above average power, but it's a really safe profile. You can still dream on a little bit of projection and he just gets the most out of his tools across the board, which is all you can really ask for, for a guy of that profile. I've got, I've got a bat at my disposal. Now I always have a ball to play with, but can you walk me? Through I wasn't looking at you until time? just now. <laughs> yeah. One more time. Walk me through what he does. So it's, it's front leg goes up. Okay. And then when that's coming down, he pulls his hands backwards. Hmm. So it's like, see how you naturally moved forward there. That's what they want to eliminate. That's what they're trying not to do. So right when his legs coming down, his, his hands load backwards. Yeah. And that allows him to stay into his back hip and swing off of his back hip and create loft leverage backspin. And super light on his front leg too. His leg comes down. Like there's almost no weight. Watch Barry Bonds. Like it's an extreme example, but that's, you know, look at the weight on his front leg there. There's like, like nothing. Guys that can do that. It's, you know, some guys, they're, they're in and out of the zone too quick. Taylor's not one of those guys. So if he's able to do that, that was a really good demonstration. I appreciate that. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, I didn't have, um, but yeah, you, you already, you eliminated your forward move after a couple reps right there. Like you, you were drifting and then immediately you started to, to really hold that back hip and, and uh, not be too heavy on the front foot. I've been it. taking a lot of lessons game? with Richard. I've been I've been taking a lot of lessons with Richard Shank. So I, I hope you're okay with that. <laughs> uh that's a little bit too much focus, I think, on on no front leg there. Um, gotcha. you have to pretend your front leg you can't pretend your front leg doesn't exist. Um, got it. <laughs> that's a whole nother story. Okay, so Dominic Keegan is a player that I think a lot of people were a little bearish on because of the fact they didn't expect him to stick a catcher. I had some concerns as to whether he would stick a catcher. Everybody did. That's why he was drafted in the fourth round. Actually, Vanderbilt had questions about that. That's why he didn't even catch that much there. Um, But also it's like not fair to him because he didn't get the opportunity to catch that much and develop there. And there's a lot of catchers that, you know, are much worse than him defensively in power five, maybe even in the sec that get reps all the time. Um, So he didn't really get the reps and get the opportunity and he's been working his butt off, saw it in the Arizona Fall League, and, and he's developed really well as a catcher now. Like it's it's going to be fringy defense no matter what, but the receiving now grades is above average. Um, the blocking is at least average. The arm is is below, but he's improved his catch and throw so much that in terms of just being quicker, that now his you know he threw out thirty percent of base dealers. It was not nearly as good in the Arizona Fall League, but. Guys were running rampant out there. It was it was crazy. It was like almost like automatic go every time out there, and pitchers didn't care about holding guys on. Um, but even if Keegan's in the fifteen percent range of throwing runners out, the improvement in framing to be above average there and to be at least an average blocker, he can be a everyday catcher now. And and you know I think the Rays feel that way too. They they they're very happy with what he's been able to do uh, defensively and, and what he's been able to uh, improve there and and feel like he's going to be able to play an everyday catcher. And we didn't really have any questions about the offense. I would have liked to see him play in the double A last year, but I think they wanted him to continue the the progress defensively. He put up great numbers in high A and low A, just mashed through there. And then in the Arizona fall, he continued to mash there. And that was while really focusing on catching, you know, for the first time, like every day in his career. So to be able to handle that defensively, make that progress while focusing on catching and mash the way that he did. I don't know how Keegan is not more highly regarded in the industry because I think you got to really pay attention to what he's doing defensively. He's he's doing like the opposite of the rushing thing where rushing, you know, w- was blocked, but he just caught and he was like the Mitch Trubisky where, Hey, you're a one year starter. All of a sudden you're a first round pick, right? Because you were so good. 
Keegan, like Jack Bolger was catching. They were, they were all splitting time evenly in 22, but in 21, Keegan caught one game. The guys that move from catcher to first base, you, like you give them benefit, but their value decreases. The guys that move from first base to catcher, does anybody do that? Like he may be one of the very few guys in baseball that effectively does that, makes the move to catcher. No one does usually. That. Usually, it's the guys that can't like hit that well. I mean, the Rays, I know they did it with like Ford Proctor, right? Because it's like, okay, you know, how can we maximize your value? The Marlins did it with like Bennett Hostetler, um, but it's sure, never but guys like, that those match. guys were never. Those guys were never top ten prospects in a system, right? No, no, this guy's a top and, five prospect in the system. Yeah, and I think Keegan could could have carved out a big league role at first base potentially um it would have put a lot more pressure on his bat but he's a guy that if you factor in the arizona fall league last year slash 290 390 476 while catching full time for the first time ever 123 games like you think a guy like that would get gassed after only playing college first base most of the time now catching most of the weeks you know most of the days of the week and and learning and and grind and when he wasn't catching he was practicing catching like i i think this is one of those nuanced situations where you have to really identify what he was doing last year in terms of what he had to overcome and, and still putting up those numbers then you look at the approach you know walking at a 13 percent clip striking out at a 20 percent clip uh, zone contact rate at 85 percent overall contact rate that's above average 90 percentile of 106 and a half like that's plus exit velocities. It hasn't manifested itself into like plus power because he is more of a, a, a flatter swing. And he's a guy that, you know, will have a little bit of a, a forward move, but he can get away with that because he, he is adjustable with the lower half and holds the back hip well enough. But, you know, it's more of this, you know, flatter swing, line drives. And that's why you look at the launch angle on fastballs. It's a little bit flatter than you'd like to see. But he hits the ball so hard that it's fine, right? We look at guys like Yandy Diaz. It's the living crap out of the ball. It's all right. line drives. It doesn't result in as many home runs. But if you make above average contact in terms of like frequency and you hit the ball hard, it'll work. Keegan, I think, does need to generate a little bit more loft because his, his field of hit is, is is slightly above average instead of Yandy's plus. But even if he doesn't, I still think there's 15 home runs in here and then a bunch of doubles. And just, again, another guy that hits the ball so hard that even if it's you know more on a flatter launch angle, he's going to be a high Babbitt guy naturally because of yeah. just how hard he hits the baseball specifically fastballs yes he hits them on the, the ground or more on a line more frequently than you know you'd like to see but his 90th percentile exit velocity on fastballs was 108 so like he's hitting fastballs so hard that he, he's going to sneak them through and have plenty of hits and that's why he had a 365 bad dip on fastball so um I just, I'm very confident in this guy being able to be a good hitter, whether he starts elevating more or not. If he starts elevating more, you're looking at 20 to 25 homers. Um, but, you know, you also don't want him to get away from who he is, which is a guy that's clearly can hit for, for some average walk and still sprinkle in enough power. Yeah. He, he, I think this year in Montgomery is as big for him as like the 2024 season is for anybody in the race system. Like he's yeah. got a lot to prove in 2024 and, and he proved a ton in 2023 between low and high A, but that was low and high A. Now it's all right. You have your get your feet wet year at the catching position under your belt. What do you look like after a full off season? What do you look like in the upper minors against, you know, guys that are two years older than you, as opposed to mm -hmm. you being a year older than them. And the last thing I'll say on him, I think it's a great point. And I think he's going to be able to make that double A adjustment. Um, I, I love, I can tell he's a hitter that's very in tune with himself in the box. And like, you'll, you'll see like with him, he, he knows that he can, he's very explosive rotationally. And you can even see that here with the swing. Um, that was a home run by the way. Uh, but his first move is, is actually a coil inwards with his hips. You can't see it from the front. Like you got to see it from an open side look, but his first move as he's about to load his hands is a coil inwards that you see like, like with his hips to really get into his backside. And that allows him to just really store some energy and uncork a lot of explosive power. But what would happen from time to time is that he would uncork a little bit early, especially on secondary stuff, which would cause a little bit more, you know, some more rollovers. And you could see like when he would be out and around a ball that he hooks foul or whatever, you know, uh, like a concerted effort to really stay in that hip. You could almost see him just like trying to find a feel and, and, and get in there and like you know, thinking about it to himself. But then when I saw him in the Arizona Fall League, he actually closed his stance off ever so slightly and and you know that can cause guys to get crowded inside 
He's so quick with his hands. I don't think it's a problem. He's so efficient with the path. But closing that stance off ever so slightly keeps him from flying off with with his front hip, you know, and, and leaving it. And we saw what he did in the AFL. He hit like 340 out there. Um, yeah. I think that slight tweak, it could be more of like a placebo thing sometimes for hitters. But that slight yeah. tweak, I think, kind of helped him feel like he's staying on it. And now we start to see him drive the ball in the air into all fields more, um, which uh, then it can be scary uh, what, yeah. what he's capable of doing. Love it. Number four. Now we get into you know some of the favorites here, right? Um, this swing, by the way, if you're watching on YouTube, is just absurd from Xavier Isaac. Uh, talk about plus plus power potential and a guy that's already getting into over plus power. Uh, Isaac, we've talked about him so much on this show. Like he's one of my favorite bats in the entire minor leagues. I, it's just such a good swing. He is just such a a polished power bat for his age. Um, and for a guy that had like a senior season, like wiped out by, by an ankle yeah. issue. Um, and then just still hit the ground running the way that he did. Um, it's power to all fields. As you can tell from this backside bomb, no doubt. Or when you're in no doubt or so the like backside bombs like that as an 18, 19 year old, it's crazy. Uh, but he also has had these one hand tied up home runs that he, he pulls, you know, out of the yard. He's hit balls, 112, 113, um, he's just a really, really projectable power bat that I think outside of junior Caminero is, is the you know, best power bat in the system. It's just so hard for me to, to not be all in on, on what he can do offensively. He's going to have to prove that he can hit enough against more challenging competition. And there's, you know, there's some things that you know, gave him trouble at, at times last year, but I mean, this guy has the potential to be a 35 home run, 40 home run beast. If it all comes together. He is a mammoth. I, there are very few prospects that make a top 100 because they're huge and they hit bombs. Like how many of those have there been in the last, I don't know, five, six years. Like I'm thinking the first base prospects that are consensus top 100, a Torkelson like hits nukes, but he was super well-rounded and he's like a freak athlete for first base. Andrew Vaughn, it was just mature. It was like, Hey, this guy is a 65 hit and probably 60 power. Like there's really not many first basemen that make a top 100 because the power is that prodigious at such a young age. Yeah, no, it's it's a great point, and I think that the reason why is that even though there are still some like hit tool questions, and he did struggle with some secondary stuff at times, hedging that with a 22 percent chase rate, and then yeah. also um, there is a feel to hit there that you can see. Like there's there's swings that he makes that it's just like, okay, there there's average contact rates in there as he just finds consistency because some of the swing some of the balls that he's able to get to it's like you know guys that have major whiff issues don't take swings like that they don't have the adjustability like that um they, they, their b swings are not going to be that powerful so um yeah even if he does whiff i think that the the power on the b swings it will just make him still too consistently productive like his fooled swings are going to be home runs enough of the time to where even if he's hitting in the 220, 230 range, I still think he's going to hit 35. You know, like, we're always talking about like, oh, if he hits enough. Yeah. I think with Isaac, it's not as much of the if he hits enough because even his B swings are going to result in home runs more than I think a lot of other players. No, man, like we're, we're talking about, and I don't want to saddle him with like an Alonzo comp, but we're, we're talking about a guy who's stealing could be in Alonzo where the K rate's like right around 20%, right low 20s, and, and he's hitting a bunch of bombs. And then the floor is a Chris Carter who like you gave Chris Carter a full season during his heyday. He was going to hit you 30. Like yeah. it was going to be a frustrating 30, but he was going to hit you 30. It's the Schwarber thing now, right? Schwarber's always going to lead major league baseball in K's, but he's yeah. going to hit him 40 because he's in the lineup every day. Um, yeah. So I guess the question is how well-rounded is the game? Worst case scenario, he just hits a bunch of bombs and strikes out a lot. <laughs> and I think we're going to get a lot more clarity on the hit tool this year. Um, but yeah. I'm, you know, and again, I know he's going to whiff, but I'm still optimistic from what I see in the box, the athleticism for how big he is. No guy that that's that big should move the way that he does in the box. Like we talked about that with, with, you know, Nick Kurtz, he's kind of from cut from that same cloth. Uh, Kurtz is even more advanced bats of all wise. That's why he's going to be a top, you know, two, maybe number one pick, but it's, he's cut from the cloth of like, you shouldn't be able to move like that for how big and physical you are. Right. Number three is Curtis Mead. And this is one of my favorite clips. Look at this pimp job by Curtis Mead. Just staring at that thing. Uh, 
second base slash third base, probably best suited at second base, but has been working on his arm strength this off season. That's the one you know concern for him is his arms well below average. If he has improved the arm strength a little bit, can play a decent third base, but it's all about the bat with Curtis Mead. And this is another guy on the other side of it now, right? Like the Rays, they do find the guys that maximize the low, lower EVs and lift and, and, and create a lot of power, but they also have a lot of guys that hit the ball really hard and maybe don't elevate enough sometimes. And, and Mead is, is, is similar there where, I mean, he hits the ball hard, really hard, and it's a lot of doubles and it's not as many home runs as you'd like to see, but with an above average feel to hit, with the ability to draw walks and you know, we've seen him elevate, you know, we've seen him do it in stretches. You've seen it in this video right here. He's elevating. Right, there's 25 home run power here. Like there's, there might be even a little bit more, but I, I don't think he's ever going to realize that because he wants, you know, he is who he is, which is contact hard line drives to all fields. And I don't really want that to change. So I, I think it's going to be mostly doubles machine can hit you maybe 15 to 20 home runs walks at a great clip, doesn't strike out. He was injured a lot of last year, and even when he yeah. came back, still mashed. Big league debut didn't go quite as we had hoped, but I, it didn't really change my perspective on him at all. Um, I think he's going to have a monster year this coming season. So what I will say is I view him in a totally different light if he shows a good ability to play third base than if he is pigeonholed into second base. If this guy is a second baseman, I'm like, oh, all right, we're leaving something on the table. But if he can play inadequate to borderline good third base, I'm viewing this guy. I mean, his value probably jumps from where do you have him in the top 100 right now? In like the 30 range, right? Yeah. So if if you were entirely sold on this guy playing a solid third base, does he jump 10 spots? So I, he's probably in the high 30 range and he'd probably jump to like the high 20 the range. Yeah. Right okay. So. We're talking about like a 10 spot jump. And, you yeah. know, when we when we get into that level of prospect, that's a huge jump. That's a big jump. He jumps over like some of the better prospects in all of baseball. So, yeah, yeah, like I, I, I guess I'm just a little bit worried that a guy that big, that strong, that powerful is going to end up playing second base because you yeah. don't want that. No, and that's totally fair, and and it's kind of like that Edward Julian thing. Like, how much more valuable would, would would he be? You know, he's still really good. How much more valuable would he be if he's able to play a hot corner or even play like a better second base? Again, me, I think me knows that. I mean, the Rays are aware of that, and that's why he's been working hard on his arm strength to to be able to you know, throw the ball a little bit harder um, and, and be able to to you know, carry the third base profile. So, I I'm very interested to see what it looks like when he comes back. Um, you know, just to start the season this year and, and where they where they put him and, and how all that all that goes. I think the injuries did kind of impact his 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 offensive game a little bit, even though he did put up great numbers in triple A. You'll get the 90th percentile exit velocity in, in, in 2022, 107 miles an hour. Like that's that's plus and a half yeah. right there in terms of the EV. So it was it was multiple ticks below that last year. And I think that was because of the injuries, but still you know, hit 26 doubles in 97 games or 12 homers as well. And three triples and only struck out at an 18% clip. Um, so I, I think, th I think this guy's gonna have a big year being healthy. And if he can play third, yeah, look, look, look out. This is going to be a really, really good player. Um, I'm I, a little bit of prospect fatigue here. Only 23 years old. He's gonna be 23 for the whole season. So another important thing not to forget. Number two, Carson Williams. <laughs> So a, a tough player to peg because of the bat, but the bat could be really good. The glove, you could argue he's one of the best defensive shortstops in the minor leagues. Um, you know, it's, I think when it all comes together for him at the highest level, it's probably a plus plus glove. It's short. It's, it's really special. Uh, the, the range, the arm, um, just the actions. And it just, he, he just seems to get better and better and better. Um, and he's just very natural. It makes everything look easy. Power wise. I mean, we're talking about plus, a plus and a half raw power. Uh, he elevates the ball pretty consistently. 23 home runs last year, and I think he can hit more. It's just this is a guy that's like if he hits enough uh, because I, I think the only reason why he didn't hit 30 is he didn't hit as much, you know, and I think that's really it. He walks. He's patient, so that does hedge some of the concern. He's, he's an above-average runner. Could be more efficient on the base paths, but, you know, still can mix that in. Like even if the hit tool is 30, if he can tap into the power consistently enough in games with the defensive ability that he has, he's going to be an everyday shortstop and a good one. Uh, but he needs to, he needs to make more contact against secondary stuff. And you see the swing. If you watch watching like the video, yeah. it, it, it's a similar thing to Ledbetter too, where like he does kind of, or, or excuse me, to Taylor, Taylor where 
he does kind of pull those hands back, you know, as the legs coming down. Um, and it's like two very different moves instead of it all kind of being in tandem. Uh, he does start his hand load earlier, but it's like the negative move. Um, I, I think he struggles to be in sync with his upper body and lower body. And I also think his swing is very top hand dominant. You can kind of see it by the finish. So it causes him to be in and out of the zone too quick. And that's why you have really rough numbers against secondary stuff. He pulverizes fastballs because that top hand dominance, like you just got to get right to the ball, but he is in and out of the zone a little too quick. His lower half is not as involved as I'd like to see it, which is crazy. Cause you could say, Oh, there might be even more power in there. Um, so that's my thing is like the swing just needs to be cleaned up a little bit, but other than that, I mean, there is so much to like here when you have a shortstop who could play plus defense and, and, uh, hit 30 home runs for you. So what do you think he was up to on the mound before he was drafted out of high school? 95, 94. Yeah. So like that's a mid nineties arm at 17 years old. If he gets to 20 years old, he can probably run it up to 95 across the dime. Like, so we're talking about a guy that could have one of the stronger arms at the shortstop position and can get to balls. A guy that I have long loved watch play defense is Carlos Correa, like bigger mm -hmm. shortstop rocket for an arm can get to balls, even though it may not look silky smooth all the time. And Williams, like while he probably does look smoother and Correa probably does have a stronger arm, it feels like the high level of defense that Correa supplies. And that's a platinum glover, but it's big dude will show off being a big shortstop effectively, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's literally like the profile. It's just a lot of those other guys, they, they're such freaks. They hit better. Uh, and that's just the one thing I'm like waiting on is just the, the hit tool. And I just keep looking at this gif here and I'm just watching the swing and I'm watching the swing and I'm watching the swing. And also it's really funny to see the catcher just put his head down immediately, yeah. but it's just like armsy man. And, and when you're armsy, it's so hard to be adjustable. Uh, and it's so hard to, to repeat, you know, some of those swings too. So you're kind of caught in between. And I mean, when you look at the numbers against secondary stuff, it's, it's just not good. Uh, when you look at the numbers of fastballs, it works, but against changeups, curveballs, and sliders. He had a buck 87 last year. Um, it's just, it's, it's hard to succeed that way. Uh, well, an interesting thing though, Fangraphs put out a really good interview with uh, Blake Butera, who's the senior director, I think of player development with the Rays. And he was talking about how Carson Williams, like he grew up like a surfer, I think, in the, and, and really like liked baseball, but wasn't like a main focus for him. He just liked to surf wasn't a huge baseball fan. Now he is, he's like a junkie and he, he, he keeps up with it, but they were joking that they used to name players from, you know, 10 years ago and Carson wouldn't even know who they are. So like he's 20 years old, he's still learning the nuances of the game is what Butero was saying. Like the nuances of an approach and, um, and just all those little things. So yeah, he's a guy that I think can continue to develop later on. And, and the fact that he's still just 20 and was still very productive overall. And the glove is already where it's at. Um, he could be a guy that, strikes out 30% of the time and could be a four win player at shortstop. So uh, I'm hoping he cuts down on it. I'm hoping he cleans up the swing a little bit um, and, and gets the lower half kind of, you know, more connected with the rest of his swing. Um, but there's, there's a lot to love there. Yeah. We get to number one and not much suspense here. Junior Caminero, uh, but we we've talked about him so many times that he, he also, when you just look at all the different clips, and then you look at Junior Caminero in this article, just the, the, the raw bat speed, the difference of just how much of a blur Caminero's bat is through the zone is, is comical. It's 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 80 bat speed. It's 80 raw power. And I, I think he's going to be able to translate that into 70, you know, game power. I I, I think Junior Caminero will hit 40 home runs at some point. Uh, I, I really do. Because he is the type that, I mean, I was watching, looking at some of the home runs from the Lightham where he's like miss hitting balls, like balls that looked like he hit it out of the catcher's mitt got on him. Like it should be a foul ball straight back to the net. And it like just floats over the right field wall. This guy's margin for error is so wide because his bat lives in the zone for so long while still being so quick and explosive through the zone where this guy, like he pops balls up that just don't stop carrying and get out of the yard. Those are the types of players who just routinely hit 30 home runs. You pair that with the fact that there's actually a pretty good feel to hit here for a guy of his power and a guy of his just uh, abilities and size. And uh, it, it's, it's pretty insane. Um, also 20 years old. So like, he's going to continue to get better hit tool wise. 
he's continued to develop the, the the defense to where I think he can play a good third plug in at shortstop in an emergency. That seems to be the focus is continuing to get the, the defense better. Uh, but a guy that just, it's insane to watch him do his thing. Hits for average. You know, uh, even if the hit tool is average, he hits the ball so hard that I think he's always going to be an off the charts BABIP guy. Um, gets away with probably putting the ball on the ground a little bit more because when he does get a pitch, he can elevate and he does elevate, he's going to hit it out. So yeah, the ground ball rate's a little bit high, but when your home run to fly ball rate's like 20%, it doesn't really matter. So that's the thing. When he gets it in the air, it leaves the yard so consistently that you know, I'm okay with the, the higher ground ball rate because a lot of those are going to sneak through too. Um, this is special, special, special power uh, that you don't find very often. Paired with, you know, at least an average field of hit, this guy's going to be a monster for a long time. And I think he's the next, you know, face of the franchise here. I'm sorely needed. And, you know, thank goodness Tampa has him. Yeah, 100%. Um, he is a rocket ship. I'm totally bought in. And, like, I saw this guy play over the course of an entire week in the Dominican. And I, I got one of those homers and it's like, how did that get out on camera? And I was just like, I was sitting right behind home plate. Um, and he did catch it out of the catcher's glove. And like, it, it was flirting with the right field foul pole and it just peeled around. It was, it was easy. And like, he thought it was either a pop-up, you know, to the track or it was a foul ball, but no, like it's an opposite field home run. I wonder, you know, like he almost, he fits the bill of a Jordan Walker for me when Walker was still playing third base, mm -hmm. but there's way better defensive ability at third base than Walker had Walker. I think everybody knew was going to make a move to first or a corner and yeah. he made the move to a corner outfield spot. Is he yeah. a better prospect than Jordan Walker was probably? I think so. Yes, I do yeah. think so. But the and offensive then, you know, profile is very Walker. similar, very similar, very, very similar because it's like, it's a good feel to hit. You know, they're going to whiff just naturally because guys like that, yeah. like you can only hit so much. Um, you know, if, if you don't whiff, you're Barry Bonds basically. So like, you know, they're going to whiff, even though it's not going to be Kyle Schwarber whiff, they're going to whiff, uh, but they mitigate it well enough and elite power and just to all feel. It's like Walker's the same thing where it's just backside bombs where he inside out swings. And it's like, whoa. And that's another guy, by the way, watch the way that, you know, he elevates consistently because of the way that he can just, swing off of his, his back leg and really yeah. hold his back hip where common arrow. It's, it's not even that like there's a lot of moving parts and you know, sometimes he's out on his front foot a little bit, but the bad speed is so freaking insane that he can just get away with, with so much more. Like he can just, and the thing is guys that can get away with shit. Like I'm always going to be extra bullish on because I've seen him make bad swing decisions and look yeah. out of sorts to a degree and still tomahawk a ball out of there, like on his yeah. front foot. Like he's a guy that you just got to throw the book away and just say like, he can just do things that, a lot of guys can't. And the thing is, both those guys, Caminero and Walker, have something God-given, but it's different what they have yeah. that's God-given. So, like, Walker's 6'6", 250. That's God-given. Like, he's a genetic freak. He's a huge human being that's going to hit a ton of homers. There's no way that, like, there wasn't a sprinkle of a little something for Caminero when, when he, you know, was blessed with this bat speed. Like, that is God-given bat speed. You can teach some bat speed. You can teach some like strength and momentum and, and physical just like torque, but you can't teach what he does. And that is that's God-given. That's special. And nobody has that minor league baseball yeah. other than him. No, I mean, most guys can't get away with that barrel tip and that leg kick and all that stuff. And like he he does. And he he always does. Like it just it, yeah, like you said, it's it's just special, God given. You can't really teach it. Walker, you know, like did have to optimize some things a little bit and, and, and maybe, you know, Kevin Arrow does have to clean it up a little bit against big league competition. We'll see. Um, but I, I just think he's going to be one of those guys. You look at like Rafael Devers, right. Where it's like, there's so many moving parts and, and the big barrel tip and whatever. It's like, he's so freakish. It doesn't matter. Um, I think it's going to be kind of like that. Um, but it's always nice when guys can do what they're doing with the movement already. And then, you know, you have a, a, a clearer thing to tweak if you have to. Um, but, it's just it's just so fun to watch this guy hit because you can just get away with so so much um and, and i'm excited to see what he's going to do this year it's probably my favorite to win rookie of the year still um I, I just think it's it's going to be one of those years where every time you tune in you're hoping you can see a moonshot and i think he's going to hit some tape measure ones this year so i'm excited to see uh, what what he can do for the rays and, and how he can help kind of fill the void of of that you know star that they thought they had and it's a lot to put on him but he seems like the perfect person perfect player to be able to rise to that occasion and be that next face potentially of the Rays franchise and one of the top prospects in all of baseball.
for sure. That that'll do it for this episode. Glad we were able to get the Rays in right now, and and we only got the the Blue Jays, and then we're done with the AL East. Is that it? After the Blue Jays, um, yeah, you did Red Sox, Yankees, and Rays, and Orioles. Yep. Orioles. So just Jays. Yep. So just Jays, and then we'll be moving on to another division, but we'll probably have the the top 100 out before then. So we'll keep you posted on that. Stay tuned also for the bonus weekend episodes. We'll let you know um, the plan for that moving forward. Probably uh, in an episode on on Monday or Tuesday to to let you know how how to you know subscribe to that. Uh, also keep an eye out on Twitter. I'll probably. Have some more details on that there. Hope you have a great weekend. Hope you enjoyed college baseball opening weekend. And I look forward to talking prospects with you next week.